Okay, we'll be making a start then. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us for this evening's session on trade union and working class history. My name is Gwaine Little and I'm General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions. We're really pleased to be hosting this series, um, in particular because of the importance of understanding our history. If we don't understand trade union and working class history, um, it becomes impossible for us to map a path forward uh, for the trade union movement today. So a really important series of sessions. Uh, we meet, for those who are new uh, to, to these sessions, we hold them on the third Tuesday of every month in the evening at 7 p.m. Uh, with a different speaker and a different topic each time. And uh, this week, I am really, really pleased that we are welcoming Marion Jump the director of the Marx Memorial Library and Workers' School to speak about British volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, a really important topic. I'm really pleased to have Marion here um, at GFTU. We're really proud of the close relationship we have with the Marx Memorial Library and Workers' School, two organisations which do so much um, for trade union education. It's fantastic for us to be able to work together. Um, so, Marion, I don't know if you're able to switch your camera on. You're really, really welcome um, today. Hi. Thanks Give so much, Gwen. It's saying my the host is stopping me from sharing my video at the moment. <laughs> my apologies. Let me just... Um... That's very odd because there's nothing on my end give me two minutes okay and i will work out why it's not allowing you to switch on your camera and then uh, we'll have you in the room um it's a little temperamental this morning so let's see Try now, see if it's any easier. Yes, there we go. Thanks Welcome, Mary. Apologies for that. Um, no for, problem. For those um, who have joined us, it is um, a webinar format event, so um, you won't be able to switch your cameras or microphones on except for the panellists that we've got up here. Um, so don't be worried about the fact that you can't un unmute or switch on your um, cameras at the moment. When we come to the question session, um, if you've put a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, we'll be able to put that uh, to Marion and we'll be able to uh, find the people who put the questions in the chat and um, unmute you so that you're able to put the questions yourself but it is in webinar format so that's why you can only see the two of us on your screen right we will try that once again now everything's switched i'm really really pleased to welcome uh marion jump the director of the marx memorial library and workers school uh, to speak to us today about british volunteers in the spanish civil war and man i'm just going to get your um powerpoint up now Thank you so much, Gawain, and thank you so much for the invitation um, to speak on this important subject. I've never actually done a webinar, but I assume that I've got powers now to move things. Yeah, oh, great. Um, so yeah, I'm Myron Jump. I'm the director of the Marx Memorial Library. I'm going to open with a few words about why this subject is particularly close to my heart um, and spell out how um, I intend to approach it this evening. I'm sure my PowerPoint seems to... Oh, it's back. Although... 
Ah, okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Marx Memorial Library, founded in 1933 in London's Clerkenwell, um, is the proud repository of the archives of the International Brigade Association. This means um, that we hold the largest, most significant archive documenting the experiences of the British volunteers in the Spanish Civil War in the whole world. And to give you a flavour, um, the 152 box archive includes letters written by volunteers under fire on the front line, diaries of doctors and nurses treating the wounded in makeshift cave hospitals and hundreds of photographs of the volunteers, in addition to some wonderful artefacts, not least the banners of the British Battalion. So um, the archive itself, there's some examples here on screen, was donated to us in 1975 when Franco finally died by the International Brigade Association. And this is the Veterans Association of the Brigades. It's very much a live archive and has been added to ever since. We still receive donations to this day. And indeed, um, last year, we even received a, a uniform of the International Brigades in pristine condition. Um, in 2018, we were successful in obtaining funding from the National Archives to employ an archivist dedicated to this unique collection, working for a full year, um, cataloguing it. So, um, and it's transformed our ability to make this collection and this history um, accessible and available to a much broader audience. Around half of the researchers who come to our library, we're open like three days a week and get about 100 a year, um, come to study the Spanish Civil War and the, and the British Battalion. Um, I'm, I hope to touch on a few examples of how we've been making this available in the course of my presentation. And given that I've got this wonderful stuff at my fingertips, I'll endeavour to illustrate the talk with elements um, from the archives to bring it to life, like this wonderful postcard from Ralph Fox, who was one of our founders at the Marks Moral Library and is writing home to his family, asking them to send him copies of The Daily Worker. We've got a few postcards just like that in the collection. Um, secondly, I must disclose a personal interest in this subject. My grandfather, Jimmy Jump, who's pictured here at the back, um, fought in the International Brigades. He was 21 when he went to Spain. Uh, he was a journalist from Merseyside, and it's quite a romantic story. He met my grandmother, who's just pictured here at the back as well, who was a seamstress um, in northern Spain, and she was an active trade unionist um, and fled the air bombardment of Spanish cities in 1937, um, along with around 20 other young women accompanying the 4,000 Basque refugee children who left Spain. <clears throat> and she, um, along with a group of children pictured here, were um, stayed in Worthing, a little colony in Worthing. And my grandfather, Jimmy, um, a local reporter, went to report on um, the arrival of these refugees. And they fell in love. And um, she said she wouldn't returned to Franco as Spain so off he went um, you know they lost the war but he won my grandmother's heart um, but undoubtedly my grandfather's um, decision to fight in Spain has completely shaped my life you know inspired me to study history um, and has ultimately led me to the Marx Moral Library where I've been for the last 10 years The Spanish Civil War is one of the most written about subjects in mod modern British history. And this is a picture of some of the brigaders, including my grandfather, actually, um, from Merseyside before um, the Battle of the Ebro. Um, a great tract has been written by historians like the eminent Paul Preston at LSE and Richard Baxel, the author of um, British Volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, on you know why they went, who they were, what the impact they had was. Um, not to mention innumerable local histories, which is bringing up all the time, and the artistic response by poets, novelists, artists. Um, so I don't intend this to be a kind of blow by blow historical account. I won't be giving, you know, the military strategy of the Spanish Republic or delving into great detail of biography. Instead, I hope to give an outline of this important chapter in British history. I hope it will give a framework um, of understanding so that we can ultimately have a discussion about the role of this episode in our own history, in the history of the working class movement. And as trade unionists today, um, to think about what sense we can make of the decision of the two and a half thousand men and women who volunteer to fight fascism in a foreign land a lifetime ago, what lessons can be learned and how do we understand that today? Um, there's sometimes a, a temptation, I think, to romanticise our history, to 
Swing on to notions of kind of high points and sanctified martyrs. Um, instead, I hope we can look for meaningful connections today and pose, if not entirely answer, some key questions. Um, what I'm also going to do, and forgive me if this is not what you're expecting, is assume um, no knowledge at all, because I think that's usually a sensible approach. Um, so I'm going to start um, by looking at the Spanish Civil War. In February of 1936, a popular front government, so an alliance of socialists, liberals and others, were elected um, in Spain with a reforming agenda, setting up schools, taking schools away from church control, giving increased autonomy to regions um, and a moderate kind of land ownership reform as well that picked up on the reforming agenda of the original 1931 government. On a kind of side note, I, I, um, I remember my grandmother telling me how she could barely hold a pencil in the 1933 um, Spanish elections because women were finally um, given the vote, they finally won the vote. And I think those, it's an important reminder of how recent this history and how radical this history was. Um, this government was, and these reforms were, were met by considerable opposition amongst vested interests, most notably the Catholic Church, landowners, the military and the fascist Falangist Party. Um, there followed a military coup, which um, the army had anticipated would be immediately successful, and it was led by General Franco. While it did have some success in the more conservative areas like Castile, for example, elsewhere, particularly in major cities like Madrid and Barcelona, where support for the Republican government was strong, it was met with fierce opposition. And there ensued a bloody civil war between the Republicans, who had the backing from trade unionists, socialists, communists, anarchists, and the nationalist or rebels who had backing from the church, the army, and the fascist party in the landowning class. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that the war was lost um, in 1939 and Franco ruled Spain as a dictator for almost 40 years, dying comfortably in his own bed in 1975. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what makes this civil war significant? I was just mentioning a few points. Firstly, the brutality. Um, the uh, the burning of churches and the attacks on priests and nuns is often mentioned. Yes, this did happen on the Republican side. It was often by rogue elements and it was never kind of sanctioned or promoted um, by the Republic in any way. Um, however, there was horrific systematic repression behind nationalist lines. Teachers, trade unionists, councillors, mayors were taken out and shot in ditches at night behind, behind the lines. Um, Paul Preston, in his... Um, enormously impressive work, the Spanish Holocaust, estimates that 200,000 were killed in the repression. And as some of you may well be familiar with elements of this history that's still being reported today, um, they're still uncovering mass graves across Spain um, as kind of future generations are, are looking to into this um, past. Um, it was also significant in the, the targeting of civilians. You can see here a picture from um, the bombing of Guernica and a, a child being treated in a cave hospital. Um, you know, most famously is the case of Guernica, which was immortalised in Picasso's famous painting. Um, the German Condor Legion targeted the market town on the 26th of April 1937 on market day when people from hillside villages were just coming into the town. Um, for over three hours, they carpet bombed the, the town and over 1,600 died. And this is unprecedented, a new tactic in war and images of dead children, all too familiar today, I'm afraid, were broadcast across the world. And we've got many of these um, horrific images in our archives. At first, the nationalists in Nazi Germany completely denied involvement, but the Basque government and eyewitnesses like the Times journalist George Steer insisted that they were Nazi planes. Franco never acknowledged any responsibility at all, instead in blaming the Basque Republicans, accusing them of setting fire of their own town. Um, it was a horrific episode and it's held up as a test of how the German Nazis used Spain as a testing ground for the Second World War. <clears throat> An enormous Guernica tapestry hangs as a reminder to world leaders as a backdrop to the UN. The de 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 debating chamber in New York, which was famously covered up by Colin Powell when he spoke at the chamber, making the case for the invasion of Iraq. 
finally, and perhaps most significantly, if we're to understand the role of the volunteers and specifically the British volunteers, Spain, the Spanish Civil War must be understood in a broader global context as a precursor to the Second World War. So I'm going to look at that next. Um, so in response to the outbreak of war, the Conservative British government with Stanley Baldwin as Prime Minister, who famously said, we, we English hate fascism, but we loathe Bolshevism just as much. So if there's somewhere where fascists and Bolsheviks can kill each other, so the better, played a leading role in establishing a non-intervention committee in August and sept September 1936, which promoted a, poly of so a policy of so-called non-intervention among Western powers. And this involved 27 states, and most notably Britain, France, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and the Soviet Union. And this policy, in effect, doomed the Spanish Republic, effectively undermi and undermining the war effort by putting the Republic under economic embargo. It very quickly became clear that the fascist powers, Germany and Italy, were prepared to blatantly flout this policy by providing troops, arms, military training, and even, as we've already heard, warplanes. Um, the treaty was an integral component of the British government's appeasement policy, which, of course, as we know, facilitated the march of fascism across Europe. And here you can see Chamberlain celebrating the Munich Agreement a few years later in September 1938. You can see here, so our, our archives are packed full of pamphlets and leaflets like this documenting opposition to this policy. Eventually too, Mexico and the Soviet Union agreed to sell arms to the Republic. Um, it's worth highlighting as well that the non-intervention intervention policy was initially supported by the leadership of the Labour Party and the TUC. Um, their policy eventually changed in 1937 due to a groundswell of popular opinion. Um, so another critical part of the puzzle, I think the next slide, please, um, we need to have in place to understand the British volunteers in the Civil War was what was going on in the home front in Britain. Oswald Mosley's BUS, British Union Fascists, had been founded in 1932, and in these early years is estimated to have had around 50,000 members. The black shirts were holding meetings, organizing rallies, and even won a few council seats in elections in the 1930s. In 1934, the famous Olympia rally in London took place um, with around 10,000 in attendance at which interruptions were violently suppressed. And perhaps most significantly, the Battle of Cable Street took place in October 1936, where the anti-Semitic BUF intended to march through the Jewish East End. Clashes took place between the police, who sought to protect the demonstration, and the anti-fascist demonstrators, most notably the Jewish community, communists, Irish workers and socialists, who stopped the demonstration using the slogan from the Spanish Civil War, No Pasaran, they shall not pass. So the fa fascist threat was seen on the doorstep. It's worth noting, too, that in the 1930s, it was a, it was a time of great economic hardship and privation. There was mass unemployment following the economic depression. The National Unemployed Workers Movement had been founded the previous decade, and hunger marches had been organised in 1932, 1934 and 1936. Indeed, in October 1936, the Jarrow Crusade, where around 200 poverty-stricken men marched over 290 miles to London to deliver a petition to Parliament, exposed deep inequalities and injustices in society. So I think we'll come back to look at this picture when we go on to look at motivations, but... Um, we will see that many involved in Cable Street, the hunger marches and campaigns for peace, um, this was a critical part of the brigade's education and their influence in volunteering to, to fight for Spain, which they saw as the kind of next step. So next I will look at the Aid Spain movement. Um, I hope I've given some context to frame the motivation and meaning behind volunteering in Spain. Um, could we have the next slide, please? But when uh, we speak about volunteering in the Spanish War, there's an assumption that we're talking about military volunteers, individuals prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice and take up arms. Um, the two and a half thousand from Britain and Ireland who volunteered to fight in the brigades were in many ways the tip of the iceberg, a very significant one, of course, but, um, but there were a multitude of ways in which people, including many women, could volunteer for the Spanish Republic. Um, Jim Firth's book is phenomenal on this. Um, he His study estimates that around 
Well, two million was raised at the time, which he estimated in the 80s was worth around 50 to 60 million pounds. I'm not going to attempt to translate that in today's money, but it's an awful lot. And these funds were raised for medical aid and food for Spain and all sorts of assistance by over 1,000 committees locally and nationally. Um, you can see here there's milk for Spain being raised and, and there were lots of um, fundraising efforts across the country. Um, next slide, please. Around 200 mes medical personnel went to Spain as well, many women, um, and funds were raised for equipment like ambulances, like this this lovely picture here. The first medical British medical unit left for Spain on the 26th of August 1936. And many of these medical volunteers, these nurses and doctors, worked in incredibly difficult conditions in cave hospitals, treating patients without adequate supplies and medication. It's worth noting as well as kind of side side note that um, enormous medical in, um, innovations were actually made on the front line um, in terms of both blood transfusion and the triage system, which is a kind of perhaps understudied part of this history. Um, there were 29 food ships also left Spain and with much needed supplies. Um, next slide, please. I think the next one's a, a lovely picture of some ambulance drivers. And the one after that is about the Spanish refugees. I've already mentioned this briefly in the context of my own family history, but I think it's worth saying a few more words. Um, so as I said, 4,000 Basque refugee children arrived in May 1937 in the biggest single influx of child refugees to the UK to date. You can see them arriving here on the Habana, the ship. And for many, their engagement volunteering for the Civil War was to assist um, in the care of these these young children. And it's a fascinating episode in British history. And um, these children were housed in what they called colonies, small um, kind of homes across the country. And this really brought um, the kind of impact of fascism, these, these children fleeing the air bombardment of their homes. They're, often their parents were imprisoned or killed um, to, to the doorstep, people's doorsteps. Um, you know, they were cared by a really wide variety of different groups, Quakers, Salvation Army, trade unions and voluntary organisations. Um, but of course, to, you know, attacked by the Daily, Daily Mail on numerous occasions. Um, the Marx Moore Library was lucky enough to welcome Emilio Martinez, a refugee who went, who arrived in Britain when he was eight years old on the ship. And we had him speak to a group of local primary school children just before he died a few years ago. And it was a wonderfully evocative account where he, he described his experiences um, as one of the first beneficiaries of the Republican government. He His parents were illiterate and he'd read newspapers to his parents having attended the newly opened school. And he said that when he uh, he arrived in the UK, there was this network, obviously, of the Basque refugee children, but also there were lots of exiled kind of intellectuals, including um, Michael Portillo's father um who who took the time to get to know some of these children and he says how he he was taught poetry by these you know these eminent um poets from spain and how that changed his life that's kind of an aside um and with this fundraising then as now those who with the least often gave the most first books full of um, really uh, moving examples um, like Douglas Hyde, who was raising funds to send a Welsh ambulance um, to Spain. He um, was appealing um, uh, for funds from the mine, from mine, local miners, and they were, you know, had opened their pain packets and handed him these coins directly from their weekly wages. And he recounts in first book that, he, you know, he'd often get home and realise that envelopes had been handed to him completely unopened, people just giving away their, their entire pay packet. Um, first highlights the kind of key features of the aid Spain movement as its political and social breadth, um, the role of the working class and the role of women. The working class communities and trade unions raised the most and women often played a leading role in them. Um, so this, this grassroots movement really illustrates the strength of public sympathy with the Spanish Republic, um, which is an important backdrop to understand the role of the brigades. An example of an opinion poll in March 1938, 57% um, supported the Republic, 7% Franco, and that went up in January 1939 to 72% supporting the Republic. So next on to the International Brigades. Um, so in total, globally, um, over 35,000 volunteered to fight, to fight for the Spanish Republic from 53 countries across the globe. 
Um, many stateless Jews and communists from Germany, Austria, Italy and Poland volunteered. And, you know, many anecdotes, they were the most fearless of fighters, unsurprisingly, as well as many from the UK, Belgium, France and the US. Um, the volunteering was initially in some instances, quite spontaneous. Um, some arrived early in Spain, um, where little militias were being formed, um, including uh, artist Felicia Brown, who was the first British casualty of the Civil War. But soon the common turn, the network of communist parties across the globe became instrumental in organizing the recruitment of the international brigades across the world. So who were the British volunteers? Many of the best known, are poets and intellectuals and so there's been developed a kind of fairly unfounded notion that this was a war of idealists and middle class dreamers and adventurers there are names like Laurie Lee and Orwell are batted about but in reality this is a tiny minority and it couldn't really be further from the truth Richard Baxel's study um, provides a, some really useful detail here where he tries to pull together some numbers um, around 80% were members of the Communist Party or the Young Communist League and the vast majority were manual workers most were aged between 21 and 35, and perhaps a little older than you might expect, with over a quarter being um, over 30. So it demolishes this kind of idealistic gap year notion. Many were from major cities like London, Manchester and Liverpool. And the most commonly listed occupations when asked when they signed up were labourer and miner, then motor driver and seaman. A high proportion of miners is an interesting one because there's a link with, um, there was a, an uh, Asturian miners' strike in 1934, which was brutally suppressed by the then kind of far right government in Spain, which pr had provoked a wave of solidarity action amongst British miners. So there was a kind of a, 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 solid, a history of solidarity um, there. It's difficult to quantify, but there were undoubtedly a high level of trade union members who went, um, significant numbers from the Transport General Workers Union, the National Union of Seamen, and of course the South Wales Miners' Federation. So they were, um, you know, primarily from working class backgrounds with large numbers from these these larger cities. Um, next slide, please. I'm just I'm just highlighting a couple of people because it's nice to give individual examples. Um, so Bob Cooney, pictured on the left, um, was a political commissar for the brigades. He was from Aberdeen, um, a Communist Party member, and we the Marx Library actually have published his memoir, so we've got lots in his archive. And I'm highlighting David Guest here, who was a Cambridge academic. Well, he was he studied at Cambridge, and he was a found one of the founding members of the Marx Memorial Library. He um, gave some of our earliest lectures and tragically lost his life in Spain. So next, I'm going to look at why did they go? Because this is the most interesting of questions, I think, really, and it's something that we all kind of grapple with. Um, we have, the Marx Library has got this fan fascinating ar archive that, that can help us answer this most important of questions. Um, you know, many liberal historians have attributed um, their motivations to be kind of idealistic or uh, motivated by ad adventure or even unemployment. And more reactionary accounts suggest that they were kind of fooled by propaganda. But um, these claims don't stand up to, you know, investigation of the archives of the individuals themselves. Um, we have a phenomenal, uh, not least, obviously we've got memoirs and letters and all sorts, but we also have a really interesting collection, um, the papers of a researcher, Michael Hines, who in 1984 surveyed the surviving brigaders. We have um, 66 surveys in which respondents were asked about their political activity and why they went. Of course, it's a little bit self-selective and the there's been a passage of time, but I think they, they really do paint a fascinating picture of a highly politically aware and informed group of men, because it were primarily men here, immersed in campaigns at the time who could see and knew that fascism was an immediate danger and felt compelled to act. Um, many had been at Cable Street and fought the BUF at rallies and Spain represented a stand that could and should be made. Um, an example springs to mind of Charlie Hutchinson, who was um, a, the only black British inter international brigade we know about. And he, we did recently did a project at the Marx Royal Library with um, a local secondary school exploring his biography, which was fascinating. And we actually ended up um, working with his family on this history, which was really interesting. But in his survey, he, he wrote, I'm, ha I'm half black. I grew up in a national children's home in an orphanage. Fascism to me means hunger and war. I also just looked in the archives this afternoon. I hope you'll excuse the look of my PowerPoint because you can see me holding my phone above these surveys. But just this is literally just plucked out of these 66. I just want to give a couple of examples because I think 
specific it's hard to paint a picture without giving some specifics so thomas Hen henry adams you may be able to read this here he was a welsh miner he says he kind of come up on hard times with the pit closures he'd been at the hunger marches anti-fascist demonstrations and national union um, nuwm meetings when asked why he went he said i decided i could no longer just talk to people but that i myself had to join the international brigades so he's obviously a man of kind of few words um, the next one is um albert charlesworth who's from oldham um he talks about how his mother had been widowed in the first world war and says we went short of good food but more than most but no more than most in those in those days he was a labor party member and joined anti-fascist demonstrations and he says from the beginning in 1936 i'd followed the events in spain from press reports and noticed the rapid intervention of fascist powers and that when um, it became clear that the republic was struggling it was then that i decided to do whatever i could to help and the next example i've got is thomas chilvers from yorkshire who was a member of the national union of seamen and he says um, when asked, you know, did you get involved in any of these activities? He says all of the above, including anti-racism and de demonstrations. Uh, and he explains that he'd previously been involved in solidarity action in support of Spanish seamen and been um, instrumental in, in the Food for Spain campaigns. When asked why, he said, came to the conclusion that victory of the democratically elected government in Spain could halt the advance of fascism. Um, so how was this information spread? I think this is another interesting question. I mean, our, our archives are full of the pamphlets and leaflets and accounts um, um, from of this time where there was obviously an awful lot of cross-pollination around various movements and trade unions and political parties. Um, and the Daily Worker, I think, also had a really critical role to play. Um, it's worth mentioning that some, you know, some families lost more than one brother. Um, and, you know, they often went, um, people went with members of their part, Communist Party or Trade Union branch. Um, next slide, please. Another anecdote that just springs to mind because it was one told to me recently by Marlene Sidaway, who, um, oh, I think I've since edited this, never mind, um, but who, who is president of the International Brigade Memorial Trust and her husband, David Marshall, had been working in the Dole office in Middlesbrough and he was 20 years old and he re used to recall that he would see these queues of young men with nothing to do with no work he was struck by the kind of madness of unemployment and had read an article in the times about the spanish republic and some of this uh, organizing society in a different way as he said and thought i have to go and find out more and he was one of the uh, the early arrivals in spain um he later wrote a poem which forgive me, I'm just going to read a brief verse of, called I Sing of My Comrades. And he said, Madrid, the magnet that drew us all, a long, slow road to Spain, at last a star for desperate men, sensing the gathering storm. And we that fought to warn a watching world were called false prophets by appeasers, yet fought for the poor of the world. So from that just brief selection of examples, I think it's quite clear that what united these people was their anti-fascism and their conviction that they must act. Um, today, there's a memorial by Ian Walters, a statue on London's South Bank at Jubilee Gardens by the London Eye, um, where there's an annual gathering. And the Cecil Day Lewis poem is quoted on the side. Um, they went because their eyes could see no other way. So what of their experience? Um, they were recruited largely in those early days um, through the King Street offices of the Communist Party in London. It was an Ill it was illegal, um, but I think such was the swell of popular opinion that no one was actually convicted. However, it was a clandestine journey. Um, they'd book um, weekend tickets to Paris. I'm just going to read you. We um, published the Marx Molly published a uh, memoir of Bob Cooney. Um, I just thought it was quite witty. He's, and he, and he, and he kept, this is from the Marks Moore Library's archives. We bought a weekend ticket to Paris. It broke my Abedonian heart to pay for a return ticket I would never use, but there was nothing else for it. Um, so once they were in Paris, they then arranged for the crossing of the Pyrenees, which was quite an epic um, endeavour by all accounts. Uh, my grandfather's memoir that was recently published, I'll just read a little extract, um, an account of his of his journey. So he says, um, panting with a tight chest, I was wet with perspiration and my feet were soaked through as I'd stepped inadvertently into a mountain stream. Then with a suddenness that shook us 
out from our thoughts, the guard at the rear shouted at the top of his voice, Ya estamos, camaradas. Estamos en España. It was the 11th of November, less than five days since setting off from London. The column halted and we sat on the wet ground, laughing, talking, smoking. Some of the Germans started singing revolutionary songs, ending in with the Internationale, which we all joined in. So some of the, as I said, some of the early arrivals joined this Tom Mann Centuria and the 15th International Brigade, which you can see the battle flag here, was formed in December 1936. I won't go into great detail, but the training was limited, the equipment and supplies were poor. And this was in stark contrast, of course, from the nationalists who had the benefit of weapons from Germany and Italy. Um, you know, often they were taken prisoner. There's lots of accounts in our archives of um, stays in hospital and illness and, and the brutality of their experience. Um, but by all accounts, the, they played an important role in a number of battles, and these are listed on this battle flag, which hangs in Prada Place at the Moxmore Library, Harama, Brunette, Belchite, and others. And there's no doubt they contributed significantly to the survival of the Spanish Republic during the course of the, of the Spanish Civil War. Our photograph archive documents all sorts of visits to the brigades on the front line, um, including... Um, Paul Robeson, I think. Oh, that's, oh, this is, sorry, this, I got them the wrong way around. This is the lovely um, photograph of um, David Marshall, who wrote that poem, is the the man in, in glasses holding the rifle just here. Um, <clears throat> so the next slide, I'm just going to give a little example because I'm trying to paint a picture of um, life on the front line. Um, so Paul Robeson, you can see pictured up here, who is a you know, communist, a great singer, sportsman, actor, a kind of superstar. Um, and we, this last year we held, the Marks Marbury held, a, we've got some archives on Robeson as well as our Spanish collection, which with this material, we held a couple of workshops with six form students, like getting them to dig around, finding out who Paul Robeson was. And the course of this preparatory work, um, we were looking at this photograph and seeing if we could find any other trace of Robeson in the archives on Spain. And we found this letter, and you can see a little extract here, um, from Alexander Park, who is a volunteer and engineer from Glasgow. And we've got a whole series of his letters written to his wife, Annie, and his sons, George and Eric. And George was just 11 years old um, when he received this letter, which um, describes, in which he describes his performance of Paul Robeson. It says, Paul Robeson sung to us, um, and I'm sure he enjoyed the occasion, as did the men. He sung Old Man River to, to new words, words of struggle and hope instead of old words of helplessness and despair. I managed to get a page of my notebook autograph by all of them. Um, and I mean, tragically, Alex um, died just a few weeks later. And George, you know, his 11 year old son kept this letter his whole life and gave it to us that marks my library along with the rest of his collections. Um, a few years ago. So we're honored to have that here and to be able to kind of keep telling the story. Um, next slide, please. Um, another kind of key chapter in the history of the, of the, of the British Battalion in Spain was the Battle of the Ebro, which was a, a brutal and decisive battle in the Civil War. We, mar we marked um, the crossing of the Ebro, you can see here. Um, this, and 85 years since the Battle of the Ebro in um, July 19, sorry. <laughs> in July 2023. Um, and we were honoured to have Dolores Long pictured here, who's daughter of um, Sam Wilde, who commanded the British Battalion during the Ebro. 90 um, British and Irish soldiers lost their lives. And Harry Pollitt, then General Secretary of the Communist Party, wrote, with their Spanish comrades, they had handled rifle and machine gun. The sun had made like red hot iron. Unknown, no big names. From back street and factory, they'll live on forever. So in, nine, in 1938, it became really apparent that the Republic was doomed. And as a last stint um, to kind of rescue the war effort, it, um, the international brigades were disbanded as a kind of desperate plea for Western intervention, really. Um, there was this incredible ceremony in Barcelona. You can see the flags and the, car and the flowers laid on the streets, um, at which Dolores Ibaruri, um, who's a communist politician and great orator, daughter of a miner, made her famous speech, which I think will resonates today, particularly uh, on an occasion like this. When I think what we're really doing is reflecting on the importance of our history and um, 
our education. If, if you'll forgive me for reading a really brief passage of this, I think. Um, so she said then, but, um, mo mothers, women, when the years pass by and the wounds of war are staunched, when the memory of the sad and bloody days dissipates in a present of liberty, of peace and of well-being, when the rancor have died out and pride in a free country is felt equally by all Spaniards, speak to your children, tell them of these men of the international brigades, recount for them how coming over seas and mountains, crossing frontiers, bristling with bayonets, sought by raving dogs thirsting to tear their flesh, these men reached our country as crusaders for freedom, to fight and die for Spain's liberty and independence, threatened by German and Italian fascism. They gave up everything, their loves, their countries, home and fortune, fathers, mothers, wives, brothers, sisters and children. And they came to us and said, we're here. Your cause, Spain's cause is ours. It's the cause of all advanced and progressive mankind. So the brigades, the remaining brigades arrived back in London at Victoria Station um, and they were greeted by Attlee and others. Um, the International Brigade Memorial Trust have done a phenomenal job in the last year of digitising some film footage that still survives from the return and using all sorts of technologies around lip reading and trying to identify who said what and it's amazing. And we did an event in December marking their return where Marshall Mattia, the filmmaker, um, presented it. So I'd urge you to, I think it is, it, I think I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube and, and the International Web Memorial Trust will be doing more work around that. Um, many of them, it's worth noting that while well, these men came home, there, there were many nurses that actually stayed out in Spain and carried on their very difficult work. Um, so, you know, uh, what next? Um, some went on to be very eminent trade union figures like Jack Jones, um, who became General Secretary of the Transport and General Workers Union. Um, some were blacklisted. Um, some were some fought in the Second World War. Others um, were, weren't were able to. Um, and of course, there was the Cold War to consider. Many are kind of didn't want to talk about it and it was a hidden history. I know that my grandfather told my father not to mention it at school. So how do we make sense of this kind of defeat? You know, the battle was lost and perhaps there was a, well, there was a moral victory in defiance against fascism, remembered the world over. But as we know, you know, Franco was victorious. He died peacefully in bed. He ruled Spain for almost 40 years and 526 Britons died. A high price was paid and a famous interview Jack Jones recounts how, you know, we lost many of the best of their generation and who knows what, what they would have done with those unlived lives. Um, I've already mentioned that Franco carried out a brutal and vengeful repression of his political opponents. Um, and when he finally died, um, what's called a pact of silence accompanied the transition to democracy, which means this is still, um, Spain and the world over, really. I think it's still grappling with this history, and you know, it's not taught in Spanish schools as a rule. History is written by the victors, as we know. And history is a battleground that we have to keep talking about it and keep um, retelling it. Uh, next slide, please. And I think an example of that is, is kind of exemplified in uh, this artifact at the Marks Memorial Library. All of our tours um, around the building end here in our little memorial garden where we have this plaque dedicated to the 90 um, British and Irish dead um, at the Battle of the Ebro and this plaque was unveiled in in 2005 and you can see it's in three parts now it was hacked up by Spanish fascists and it's an all I mean it's a, it's quite a piece of work I mean it would have taken an angle grinder and thankfully, the Unite the Union um, and the International Gay Memorial Trust got it back to us, and we were and we've had it unveiled as a kind of, uh, uh, well, a memory. Uh, it shows that this isn't history. This isn't dusty old history. This is history that we have to keep retelling, and keep talking about. Um, and of course, it's still contentious. Um, you know. There's a lot of revisionist history around at the moment, equating communism to fascism. Indeed, we see this in the new guidelines. Um, on or well, new definitions on extremism and the new kind of prevent guidelines where um, socialism and communism are highlighted. Um, so to go back to where we started, the Marxism Library, you know, we're home, we're, but we are the home of these wonder, these important memories and stories um, of those who volunteered to fight in Spain and volunteered in solidarity with the Spanish Republic. Um, we work with partners, including the International Open Memorial Trust, um, 
you know, we, you know, our reading room is open, we inform histories, but we also do an awful lot of engagement work, particularly with schools. You know, we regularly now have groups of six forms coming and looking through those surveys and finding out for themselves in uh, who were these people and um, what motivated them? You know, they were not much older than me. What, how did that happen? Um, we done a number of exhibition projects and I was just recalling actually that the GFTU generously um, financed the conservation of uh, four of our aid Spain banners that we then displayed at Islington Museum a few years ago and to be honest we frequently have Span Spanish visitors who who were you know in tears looking at the fact that we're telling this history we, we know we're, we're looking after it and it's sort of important so what but okay, the final difficult bits to answer are well what can we learn and, and you know what's the value of going back and looking at this important episode in history. I think it's difficult to sum up, but I'm gonna raise a few points that hopefully can prompt more of a discussion in a minute. Okay, the first point I'm gonna mention is democracy. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I think we often forget how young, how kind of parliamentary democracy in the West is. And um, in Spain, it was very long, young democracy. Uh, and I think it, it, it was an example where people made the wrong decision and, and best, you know, they voted for the wrong radical or reforming um, government um, that was elected and then that decision was quashed by vested interest, the landowners, the aristocrats, and um, in this case with support from the Western imperial powers. Um, and you can see that across throughout the archive and the banners that saw democracy and peace are always what was being fought for, democracy and peace, as a counterpoint to fascism, militarism and dictatorship. Um, second point I'm going to make is the I guess the lesson of a popular front, um, you know, what's very significant looking back is the broad base of this grassroots aid Spain movement. Um, the fact that, you know, there was a, a popular front strategy meant that there were points of unity were found across um, across different movements and groups um, and a willingness to work together to defeat a common enemy. Um, internationalism. I think what probably is the most striking when you first kind of encounter this phenomenal story is that is the simple equation that was made that their cause is our cause and that people knew they had more in common with you know miners across across the sea than they did with their own ruling classes and that's selflessness i think um you know when you look back at you know, the horrific episodes in 20th century history this is a kind of shining beacon and an example of humanity i think there's often a lot of focus on anti-fascism. Obviously, that is the uniting factor. But I think it's also worth reminding ourselves that they're also defenders of things that we have to keep fighting for today. Education, health care, women's rights, trade union freedoms. And finally, perhaps most importantly, I think, um, uh, given that they're kind of what we're talking about today and what this whole series is about, um, it's a reminder of um, what the organised working class is capable of. Um, you know, this was a time when the political elites and even the leadership of our own movement um, didn't get it, <laughs> and, and, that it and that it was and that this movement was led by the organised, politically engaged working class. I do think this is such an important thing to remember, particularly there's so much of the kind of current political discourse is quite disdainful of the working class. You know, we're often labelled as ignorant, reactionary. It's worth remembering this very proud example. Um, which of course begs the question: How, how you know, how does it? How do we organise? What um, and what set this in motion? And I think I've already touched upon this, and probably want to open this out very soon. But there's a you know, there's a confluence at this time of organisations and campaigns which sprung out of specific circumstances, political, social, and economic um, circumstances in the 1930s. And campaigns around peace, anti-fascism, unemployment, hunger marches, the Communist Party. Um, and a group of people who could see the immediate threat of fascism and a singular analysis of what was going on and what needed to happen. So, you know, we all know that people act in the circumstances that they're given, but perhaps there are lessons in making connections, in promoting internationalism and in fermenting political education. I think understanding our history is a really important first step. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to kind of finally end just by doing a massive pitch for the Marks More Library because we are unique in looking after all this stuff and making it available. It's nowhere else. Um, we, um, you know, we've we do events, courses, all sorts. We're a membership of organisation, and also urge you to look up the International Labour Moral Trust. Do such an important job on this as well. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, Marion, for uh, an absolutely fascinating talk. And I think some really, really important lessons drawn out there from the uh, history of the volunteers in the International Brigades in the Spanish Civil War. Um, and, and maybe some questions for us today about how we organise and why we organise and what brings people together to organise collectively. So um, as I said earlier, this is a webinar format, but we really want to encourage people to engage and to get involved in discussion. So down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box marked Q&A. It's separate from the chat. It says Q&A at the bottom. If you click on there, you're able to add your own questions. You'll see those appearing uh, in the box there. And then what we'll do is rather than me read them out, um, I'm going to come to the individuals who put questions in the box and unmute them so that they can uh, so that they can ask their questions. And first of all, uh, we've got Joe Hewitt. So Joe, I'm just going to find you in the attendees list now and invite you to uh, put your question to Marion. Hi, Marion, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Hi, yeah. So um, I don't know an awful, I must admit to not know an awful lot about the Spanish Civil War. I knew there was a link with trade union movements, internationalism, but as a bit of a complete novice, but I'm a bit of a, I do love my history. I'd just love to know, what, is there any books you'd recommend for somebody who's new to the subject? Definitely. So um, Paul Preston is kind of the eminent historian on this, as the, and he's written a short history, which is really Ooh, straightforward, um, a nice way in. Uh, Helen Graham is also written, you know, you get those like introductory guides. Yeah. Um, she's written one of those, which is good. Um, on the British Battalion, R Richard Baxel, yeah, it's written an awful lot on on like the individual biographies and what and those kind of subjects. In fact, he's just got a new book out that we're launching at the library in June. Um, so yeah, are those three authors, and they 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 have written kind oh. of some nice intros, I think. Thank you very much. No worries. Fantastic. Thanks very much for the question, Joe. Um, I'm coming to Kevin next. You've got two questions in the chat there, so feel free to uh, unmute and ask them both. Would you like me to ask them both? Yes, go both for up. it, go for it. Yep. Um, anyone else who's got questions, please do pop them in the chat now. A right. uh, couple of questions for you then. How widespread was support in Britain for the Republicans in Spain? And by that, I'm asking, did it cross party political brown dues? Was it local community support? Or was it just at national level? And the second question is, how did the Spanish Civil War impact on both UK politics and society in both pre and post World War Two? What what and what do you consider the lessons are for today? Okay. Um... Oh, I was just reading. Oh, okay. I'm going to review these as answered. Okay. So um, in terms of support and for the Republicans, it was widespread. How And and there were examples where it crossed party lines, um, particularly with um, the famous the Duchess of Athol, Conservative MP. Um, she she was support, she, particularly around the refugee children. There was a lot, it was a lot broader around some of these things. However, that has meant that there's been this effort to kind of rewrite some of this history as being completely all humanitarian. And, and that, you know, that clearly isn't the case. Um, but, but there was, particularly, yeah, in local community groups and things like that, there was broader support. We had like the Quakers Salvation Army and things like that, um, viewing it as a kind of ethical question, particularly around the refugee children. Um, but having said that, I, I, you know, it wasn't when it comes to actually volunteering for Spain and things like that. I think that was that was certainly more politically specific. I mean, and you ask about national or local, the, the very local in, in their makeup, there were kind of national coordinating committees. But, um, you know, archives are full of you know, aid Spain weeks, dances, concerts, film screenings that all happened and by local the local committees that sprung up. Um, impact on UK politics and society that's a big question I mean uh what I didn't mention I suppose I mentioned the Franco's repression but um, we also you know there was a whole movement um that continued in, in opposition to Franco in this country um, particularly in the 1960s and 70s where um and there were kind of reports of particularly around political prisoners and the, and and um, executions and things like that um, that sprang up. And in fact, there was a organisation called Appeal for Amnesty in Spain, which um, you know included letter writing and was the inspiration for Amnesty International. In fact, um, but 
as I said, there were, uh, I mean, post World War II, the Cold War was obviously cast a great shadow over um, how people understood the Spanish Civil War. Um, you know, uh, so I think that had a major impact. Um, gosh, lessons for today. Well, I, I, I hope I kind of opened up some of those questions in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult, it, you know, you don't, as I said at the beginning, it's tempting to just kind of idealise, but I think we can only really learn lessons if we actually understand, try and understand the circumstances that led so many people to find common cause um, like they did. Uh, and so I think, I mean, well, I think what's striking about those accounts that we looked at just this evening is how, you know, cognizant people were of what was going on and that big picture and the role that they had to play and the role and the immediate threat Brit Britain faced. Um, I mean, I'd, quite, I'd like to hear from others really about what people think of lessons. I hope that's answered a little bit, a few of those. Thanks, uh, Marion. And if you've got your own views on the uh, what some of the lessons are of the Spanish Civil War, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat to put those up and we'll bring people in. Um, I've got um, next Luisa, who uh, I'm just going to um, allow you to unmute now. Okay, Louise is not unmuted, so I'm just going to ask a uh, um, question. Oh, no, yes. she has unmuted oh. now. Sorry, I've unmuted myself. Good That's evening, okay. everyone. Marianne, thank you very much. Um, it was <laughs> when, when, when I, when I, I, it was one of the things that, you know, I, I learned about when I was in, in boarding school <laughs> in Nigeria. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because my, my dad, my dad um, uh, had, um, came back, was in um, Burma during the Second World War, he was a technical engineer. And he, he used to tell us these stories about how Ghanaian and Nigerians were also, you know, many British, when he, many black British people went to, 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 to fight um, as volunteers. But they, you don't see any mention of them in the history books, which is very sad. You know, my, my, my father had to fight for recognition uh, because he was awarded a star of Burma. And he had to, but he had to fight for recognition of the Africans and the Caribbeans who were, who were sent out there to Burma and also to the, as, who went as volunteers because they could withstand the mosquito bites. <laughs> Whereas the, a lot of, you know, we, they forget that. Uh, and there were lots of um, African Caribbean women as well who went out there as nurses, but you, you don't hear any mention of them in, in, in the books. And I, you know, I find that very frustrating that, you know, <laughs> the, you know we, we were not included in any of this history and uh, it's very exasperating. I mean, I, I don't know a complete, uh... Thanks for that. I don't. I don't have numbers to hand on how many African Caribbeans fought in the Spanish Civil War. And what I can mm. say, what we've done, um, some, just talking about the archives again, um, some interesting work with uh, looking at the, at the American volunteers. Yes. And there's a. Um, we had a, a workshop with some, teenagers and in the library um, a few months ago when we were yes. looking at, actually it was the Paul Robeson one when we were looking at um, yes. the experience of the American volunteers because it was the example where Oliver Law was the um, first um, black officer in America Correct. to yeah to, exactly and like we and we told the story and uh, yes. it, I thought I have to say I thought it was fascinating because some of the um, teenage the kids were like oh he must have been really good then I was like well I'm sure he was but that wasn't why he became an officer in that context it was because there was so, it was a socialist project but yes. for those who don't know the story, can you tell us? Because obviously you two I'm know sorry. the uh, no, that's right. Can you tell us a bit about um, this character? Um, I mean, I don't know loads and loads about him, but I know that he, you know, he's well known for being the first American officer, black officer, mm. to um, lead uh, integrated um, troops, basically. So, yes, the, but there he, was still there was still that segregation because I, you know, if you look at the because of because of the of the what do they call it the the stupid law the segregation in America. 
um, even even within the military, even during the, the First World War, even the Second World War, there was segregated, you know, and, and I mean, I, even the, 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 the African-American women who came over to Britain, you know, who had to help sort out all the posts, you know, it, it's only now that we've we, the, a, a film is coming out to 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 honor these women who were based in Britain, and to but you know African Americans were treated awfully by their own American. There was still a lot of racism going on, and, and that is why a lot of them came to you know came as volunteers to escape American racism to 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 come to Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's um, you know it it would be wonderful if you know we could record recognize it. I I still have my my books about British appeasement to to Nazis and and all that. You know, it's one of the things I learned as a strategic study student. You know, um, one of the class we, you know I studied with uh, at University of Aberystwyth, is where I did my master on uh, on um why what, you know why why there is um uh, my my topic was was to write about uh why uh, leaders uh, turn against their own people and uh, i was studying about uh, mugabe then uh, which nearly got me into trouble because uh, i finished the first part but i couldn't publish my paper because Mugabe was still alive, and I discovered that he had agents. They had agents here targeting Zimbabweans, black and white Zimbabweans. You know, almost the Putin Putinesque way of behaving of of targeting people who talk about them. So, but it 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 was a very sad history for for Spain. But you know, when he decided to hand over to to Juan Carlos, I was living in Brussels then. And it was in, I, I lived I was living in the Spanish community. There was great celebrations in the streets. <laughs> um, thank, they, thank they, you, thank you, Louisa. Thank yes. you. Yes. Um, but it, but, but I, I didn't know that it was a, that was a time when our own British fascist fascism with um, you know, with the brown shirts. I didn't realize it was the same time it started, and. Indeed. Um, I, I was just looking at a, there's a comment from Christina in the chat there who says um, one might say that trade unionists are a special people who quick understand nation struggles and problems and are willing to sacrifice. Uh, oh, sorry, lost it there. And are willing to sacrifice uh, their lives to save fellow human beings. Long live trade unions. Um, it, it just sparks a question from me, actually. What was the role? Because obviously with the non-intervention agreements, um, it was made very difficult for people to go and volunteer um, in the Spanish Civil War when when uh, Western European countries had, had signed these agreements to say that they, they wouldn't be involved. What was the role of trade unions and other organisations in recruiting people um, to go and uh, support the international brigades in Spain? And how difficult was it for people getting getting out there? Um, well, I think that a lot of this is very kind of localised, I think. Um, as I mentioned, I think, a lot, I mean, a lot of it was very grassroots. So, as I said, the leadership of most trade unions in the TUC weren't particularly cooperative or helpful. But in practice, in branches, there was lots of instances where a number of people would sign up together. Um, in terms of the recruitment, um, I mean, we've got these fascinating archives of, the, of documenting some of the recruitment process and like interviews and things like that. Um, and some people like Bob Cooney, actually, who I mentioned his memoir, were deemed kind of too important on the home front <laughs> and were told, you know, um, we want to keep you here. But he eventually persuaded um, the Communist Party that he wanted to go out. Um, I think I think um, some people actually joined the Communist Party in order to um, in order to go out to Spain, because that was a, a way of doing that. Um, but as, as it was touched on earlier, a lot of this work was really, really localised. I think this, like the South Wales miners, for example, were a kind of huge bastion of support for the public in all sorts of ways and had a massively disproportionately represented. And same goes for the shipyards in, in Scotland, for example. Um, 
yeah it's an interesting question about how difficult practically speaking i mean obviously i read out those two like little accounts of the kind of yeah. difficulty of the journey and that those kind of conditions however it doesn't sound like people were actually kind of stopped um so it is an interesting one. I think, I mean, I'd be surprised if people, if they say those people buying weekend tickets to Paris, it wasn't kind of like a little bit clear that, but that blind, uh, uh, and I, you know, that it was decided that it wasn't raised. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so pe people were clearly openly going, um, mm. but, um, but, but, but still that kind of Western position of non-intervention was there. Um, Louisa, did you want to come back in? Yes, I was going to say that I, I think it, the TNC was involved, I, I believe, from what Dad was saying, because it all started with uh, raising funds. I, I th they had uh, Spanish Workers Spanish workers Fund, I think Dad said. But it started off with fundraising for, to supply food and, and medicines. But I think it was also to escape um, the class structure of Britain. A lot of them went, you know, they thought it was an adventure like they did, you know, in the First World War. But it, it all started with, with fundraising and, uh, you know, just for medical aid and food to, to Spain. And um, and a lot of Welsh people went as well from, from here to, to escape. And, you know, it, it's, always, it, it, it always be, it's always because of the oppression that people experienced here. That's why they went to decide to, you know, to get out and, and go go there, you know. Um, and, you know, it, the, the, the trade union have always been involved in, in fighting for, in, in just causes uh, to, to, for the oppressed. Um, but, but then they started changing, you know, when, uh, after the Second World War, when they, the trade union participated in <laughs> in the immigration laws to stop Polish uh, fighters, airmen, to come and work here unless British people took the job first. And yet, these are the people who worked with us during the Second World War. And we see the same thing that's going on in Britain today, where you have... Well, I mean, I, I, I personally, and I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I strongly believe that the immigration problem we have in this country today started from when we went to, we went to fought a war in Iraq, and then we got rid of, uh, um, of, of uh, Gaddafi, who was trying to, who was prevented from creating an African monetary fund so we could get away from the IMF and, and uh, you know, and Afghanistan. We should never have gone to where there, was, there were never any immigration problems when those two men were alive. You know, every, every politician, even in Nigeria, they get rid of each other, you know. They had good, everything was free, education was free uh, in, in Libya. You know, people, we should look at all that when Western governments interfere in other countries and dis have become disrupted. But, and the, the British people, you know, they, they just felt they wanted to escape and be, do something, you know, useful. You know, we had our women going to the Crimea war. Why, why did we go, why did we go, you know, why did women, we, our people go to the Crimea war to fight as well? Because the trade union has always believed in liberty and, and freedom. And um, and I think we should carry on that. You know, we should still carry carry that. You know, that uh, spirit. Of, that tradition, that spirit onwards. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we should. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that that's why I'm. Uh, my first trade union was uh, PCS. Uh, you know, when I was working for the Welsh Assembly government, but it was when I I change and I started seeing justice and I decided to become an actress and join equity and I saw the misogyny, the racism and all that kind of thing that you know and and more than that is is the way w women were treated and and you know it was all it was all about class who you who you who you, who you came from where you were educated and I thought I'm not going to lie down and take this even at uh, my age I, I still want to champion and that's why I'm doing all these uh, courses, you know, I've just completed uh, the TUC, I'm uh, to train the trainer, 
to become a sexual harassment. I've done become green and all that. But and it is because of the injustice and the way this government, the conservative government, have treated the British people as if we were rubbish, uh, that we are of inconsequence and lied about getting out using Brexit was all based on lies. Uh, and then to discover that people like Rhys Morgan and everything before it's, it happened, they ship everything to, to Ireland. You know, Nigel Farage, who I knew when I was living in Brussels, I was living next to the European Parliament. I used to call him a, a fraud because he, you know, I said, your wife is German, your kids don't have to worry and all that. You know, when he came mm. down to Merth, I challenged him and he just smiled at me. But, you know, all that, you know, we 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 need to fight back. We need to, I, I, I pray to God that, you know, I know he cared some and the labor doesn't want to talk about it, but I think it's time we take back uh, trade union power. We need to. We've lost you there, Louisa. Um, I, 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 I want to try and see that we can, we recruit as many people as possible. Um, and, and we need a, a, a proper constitution. You know, our, our constitution needs to be based on human rights. And this government has trodden on every British person's from the moment they're born to the moment they die, they've trodden on all our human rights uh, in any way possible they can. And they, and they, we've allowed them to get away with it. And, yeah. And, and now when we march down the street, they want to call us terrorists. <laughs> uh, it's, and it's incredible, isn't it, the crackdown on civil liberty. I want to draw a couple of a couple of parallels there. So the question mm. of, um, you, Louisa mentioned the... Um, wars in um, Iraq and in Afghanistan. And I, I think there's a really interesting parallel there in terms of um, the those those wars were um, wars that the, the British people campaigned against our intervention in for us to stay out of and not get involved. Whereas you almost had the opposite situation in the Spanish Civil War, that it was a, a just cause, something that actually the trade union movement, the working people wanted to build support for the anti-fascists in Spain and to try and save democracy in Spain. And yet non-intervention was the policy of government then. And then the, the other parallel I think was drawn out there is uh, Louisa mentioned the whole question of people talking today about an immigration problem. But actually, as you mentioned earlier, Marion, those same arguments were used around the, um, around the, uh, children who came to Britain during the Spanish Civil War by papers like the Daily Mail whipping up kind of fear of immigrants coming to this country and so on. So I just wondered if you wanted to comment on any of those parallels. And then we've got one more question in the chat to put to you before the end of the meeting. I think the um, question of intervention is a really interesting one because I thought, unfortunately, I think this is another example of the kind of rewriting of history where, um, where you know the Second World War is, is used as an example, and this kind of period of appeasement is now used as an example of like we must intervene, and which in essentially kind of imperialist endeavours. Um, so I think it's a really interesting example of how kind of those historical narratives are being kind of repurposed in a really dishonest way. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, you mentioned the immigration thing. Yeah, there's been some really fascinating like local histories on things like that, where, uh, in fact, the example of Charlie Hutchinson, who is a black international brigadier from Fulham, a teenager, when he went, um, he was uh, the chair of his YCL, Young Communist League branch. Um, and in his survey, you know, the ones we were looking at just earlier, he mentioned that the tax attacks on the Daily Mail, we eventually found that, I should have dug it out for today, where they where the Daily Mail have a, obviously they're particularly not going to like Charlie Hutchinson um, and, and talked about him like, you know, cor corrupting um, other kids and all this kind of nonsense. So, yeah, still kind of very much rings true today. But interestingly, actually, with the, the Basque ch children refugees, I didn't mention um I mentioned that, you know, obviously it brought the, that kind of immediate threat of fascism and, and war on people's doorsteps. But when you look at like local newspapers, it was, wasn't was long before they were evacuees from the major cities um, coming into these same communities. Um, and, and really, you know, this kind of shocking poverty that was another kind of way in which that happened again. It's kind of interesting kind of repeat. Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And the last um, 
the last question we've got time for today, we've got just a, a few minutes to answer, um, is from um, Penny. So, Penny, you should be able to unmute now and ask your question. Smashing, thank you very much. As, as a po somebody born just after the Second World War, then most of my life, people have been talking about fascism as being defeated. It was something that was sorted out in 1945. Um, and yet what I'm extremely worried about is the signs within Europe, um, plus the relative weakness of the United Nations um, activity at the moment and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of, of 1948 is not respected in large parts of the world, including in parts of Western Europe. And so I get worried about what's happening in Hungary and what's happening in Italy. Um, and I just wonder if, yeah, in two minutes, if you can um, say anything about what the fate of the Spanish Republic teaches us for now. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> More question there for the for the final. <laughs> Um, but, but a really important one, I joke, but it a, really is a really important one. Anyway. Um, well, I th well, first, I think you're right about the immediate threat of fascism in Europe today. I mean, and, and, and just without harping on about history all the time, like I think it is illustrated in this kind of complete rewriting of history. You know, the monuments to the international brigades are in kind of a kind of theme park in Budapest with all sorts of other, you know, um, there's an equation of communism and all of this anti fascist activity. Um, with fascism, with these kind of notion of kind of two extremes, that's a complete rewriting of of history as we know, and and has, and has left the door open. Um, in terms of what can be, what lessons can the fate of the Spanish Republic teach us? I mean, I, I have to say, I think the the resounding lesson is the kind of treachery of the British government, really, and the kind of and 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 a counterpoint to that, how actually the majority of the British people. Could see what was going on. I mean, it's a kind of it's a it's a tra it's a tragedy in many ways. Um, sorry, I'm grappling with it a little bit. Um, sorry, it was too big for the last. No, question. it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good I, question. I, 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 I think you're right. I mean, go sorry. On. Yeah. No, go on. Go on, Mary. I think I think we, we I think Penny raised a really interesting point about the notion that somehow fascism is this thing that's been dealt with and that we don't you know and and also the rewriting of history and that the idea that like the whole of you know the whole of Britain we were never you know we were never occupied we were never had to answer those questions did we about you know who would have collaborated we were never challenged mm -hmm. on that so it's easy for the kind of national narrative to be one of well you know that of course we of course we all oppose that and of course you know, we had this glorious victory in 1945, um, rather than having a more kind of critical history that would probably lead to some more probing questions being asked, mm. I suppose. Yeah, spot on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that 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 rise, once again, of the far right and of fascism in, in Europe um, is a challenge that we as, as trade unionists, as activists, as internationalists face today isn't it that rewriting of history that paints the anti-fascists those who fought and gave their lives to hold back fascism whether that was in spain uh, during the spanish civil war or, or whether that was later in the second world war um the the kind of repainting of those people as somehow just as bad and the re rehabilitation of fascists in so many countries in europe is, yeah. is really frightening and something as a movement we need to, to challenge and uh, and fight back on. And, and maybe that brings us full circle to where we started at the beginning, that unless we really understand history, unless we promote that understanding of what happened in history, um, it will be reframed, it will be rewritten, and it will be used against us. So the importance of, of these sessions and of, of sharing and understanding of trade union working class history is absolutely essential. Um, thank you so much to Marion for joining us today and thanks for the uh, Marx Memorial Library and Workers' School for the ongoing collaboration. Do check out um, their website, which Marion sh shared with us. Um, 
to uh, to find out more about the courses that the library and worker school offer and, and the materials that they have there. And do also check out the General Federation of Trade Unions Educational Trust. I'll put the link into the chat now. It's gftuet.org.uk to find out about the other courses that we offer. Um, and uh, do join us for our next session, which will be in one month's time. And I believe that we are looking then at the great dock strike. So um, look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a lovely evening and uh, hope to see you again uh, on future GFTU course. Thank you very much. Thank you.